Awesome, Lexi. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. You and I met a few months ago. You've done some super fascinating things. You're also in the buying and selling world, of course, with theygotacquired.com. It's one of my new favorite podcasts. I just told you I was binging a bunch of them while on vacation. Um, and, and you also have a very complimentary site that goes with it. Tell us just a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to this point in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a media entrepreneur. I started my uh, career in journalism as a reporter at uh, traditional newspapers. I ended up um, leaving those jobs. And in 2010, I started a blog management agency. That was my first business. I really started as a freelancer and then morphed into a small agency. And that agency was eventually acquired by one of our, our clients. It was a personal media finance, a personal finance media brand called the Penny Hoarder. And I went in house there along with several members of my team to build the content operation there. And then a few years later, I left there. I ended up picking up a project I had worked on previously. It was a website called The Right Life, right as in W-R-I-T-E, so a website for writers. And I sold that in 2020. And all those experiences led me to start, um, they got acquired. So it's a media brand where we help entrepreneurs sell their businesses. And we have quite a few buyers in our community as well. I love that. Um, we're going to talk about they got acquired here in a second. Let's dive into just a little bit. You started um, started agency around blogging in 2010. Was probably like like one of the best times to really get into that space. And then that sort of morphed into you got acquired, and it was an aqua hire into the penny hoarder, which I mm -hmm. imagine most people have heard about or at least ended up on their on their site. They're pretty large. Tell us how that experience went because you you kind of got acquired and then started working with a new boss. What was that like becoming an employee and having someone to report to versus mm -hmm. like you were running the show. Yeah, it was definitely a transition, but it was, it was pretty great because I, so Kyle, the founder of the Penny Hoarder, he, he founded the business in 2010. We started working together at the beginning of 2014. He became one of our clients. So we were then running the site, running the blog. And he acquired my business a year and a half after we started working together. So at the time I thought I loved I loved running my own show. Like I, I like the autonomy, the freedom, so many things about it. So I never thought I'd be an employee again, but we worked together really well. Um, I knew I liked him. I liked his vision. And when I went to the penny hoarder, I was a second employee. We brought several members of my team as well. And we got to do things there that were much bigger than I would have done on my own. It was also a bootstrap startup, which is one of the reasons why I agreed to join but we were well resourced, and so we we grew fat. Like we added, um, I think we were up to a hundred people in less less than three years. So it was a fast growth um, trajectory. So I got to learn a lot about um, startup infrastructure and operations that I wouldn't have done on my own. That's pretty cool. So I think yeah. about like just that overall experience, and you're able to grow one your own business so much faster because of the resources behind it. But then also you know, do, you had these, all these new experiences and operations of, mm -hmm. Hey, this is how a bigger company runs. This is how bigger teams run. Uh, was that something you thought was going to be the case? Or was it sort of just like, Hey, we're going to sell this makes sense. We really like this, this new owner. Um, and then all these other ancillary benefits came from it as you joined. Well, it really changed the trajectory of what, trajectory of what I was doing because at an agency, we had a bunch of different clients that we were serving. And when I went in house there, they, so they, they acquired us for our people, like me and the team and our processes, like how we created content and our larger network of freelancers that were also creating content. And because of that, when we went in house there, it kind of gave that side of the business a running start. Cause we, I'd already been doing this for a couple of years, you know, so we could build that side of the business much faster. So we let go of all of our clients and we were just doing, we, I mean, we became, became the penny hoarders content team. So it was very different. It was a shift in what the kind of work we were doing. Um, but to answer your question, I think some of the some of the benefits I expected and some of them, you know, I couldn't have seen coming, but it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. That's pretty cool. Um, and then you're, of course you're there for a little bit and then you start, you, you, um, I don't know if you started the right life or you, you kind of resurrected it back to life. So tell us how you started that next business or, mm -hmm. you know, resurrected it back to life. Yeah. So I actually started the, the right life when I was running the blog management agency. So this was in, 
I want to say 2013, we were running blogs for, for businesses. And what I realized was that we were helping these businesses grow audiences but once we, if they were to like sever ties with us, we would, we wouldn't have any upside from that blog that they, we had helped them grow. Um, so we ended up putting our processes and our, our systems to work for our own asset. So I said, let's start a site that we can run for ourselves. And then we get to, we get the upside as it grows over time. So that's when we started the right life. And, and we treated it just like a client. Like we had an editor run that site. We had freelance writers write for it. Um, we allocated budget to it just like we do did for all of our client sites. So um, I've, I've mm -hmm. seen that happen a few times with agencies. And mm -hmm. Lexi, it, it is always kind of a no brainer to me that like you have these agencies, they, they build up the brands that they work with and the brands get big enough. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to do this in-house because we're now huge, right? Like you kind of lose that on the equity that you're all building. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know some agencies are doing this well. Why don't more agencies decide to do that and decide to go down this ownership path? I never thought about it before. And I, I'm not sure I thought about it in like a macro, like I didn't see it was a trend and decided to do it was a trend. I just thought this would be smart to have our own asset and also do things the way that we want to do them. <laughs> Cause you know, we, I thought that could be more lucrative. Um, we also use it as like a place to experiment. So for example, if we wanted to try a WordPress, plug, WordPress plug it on our client sites. We try it on our site first and see what happened. Um, yeah. I don't know why more don't do it. I think maybe there, it certainly takes, like you're putting money into it initially instead of taking money out of it. So, you know, an agency can be a real cash cow. And, and I, I think it's smart to use some of that money and reinvest it into an asset of your own. But um, I can see how, um, it could be more lucrative if you have, if you're landing big, big client contracts than taking time to build up your own asset. Right. And I, I sort of see it as like, they can be different business models because uh, mm -hmm. uh, an agency is actually service-based, totally different than, you know, owning it. Mm -hmm. And I can totally see why, you know, you're putting money towards it. It seems like a black hole, but I also think from like a diversification standpoint, I've seen agency owners crush it and just make mm -hmm. so much cash flow, so much money. On the flip side, I've seen them lose a few clients, you know, Facebook algorithm changes and all of a sudden they're just, you know, not printing cash as much as they used to. Whereas if you've got some diversification in there too, um, that awesome. You've got such, such an interesting background with all of that. Let's, let's dive into a little bit about your newest project, because this is the one I'm, I'm so excited about. And you've, it seems like based on your past, you've sort of been, um, not really groomed, but like you've had the right experiences to be able to do this media outlet with theygotacquired.com. Mm -hmm. And for anybody listening, like this is such a like complimentary type podcast and content medium. Um, highly recommend jumping over and listening to this too. So the way I see it is it's sort of like how I built this, but for selling. So it's so much more interesting, you know, especially for this audience here. Um, tell us how you kind of came up with that idea and, you know, you're, you're six months into launching. Yeah. So we have a podcast. We also have a newsletter and a website um, with lots of written content as well. Um, and when I was trying to think about like what I wanted to do next, I knew I wanted to do a media company because that's my background. I wanted to leverage that experience, but I wanted something kind of new that would challenge me. And this challenges me in two ways. One is it's m and which I am not an expert in m and I mean, I'm learning a lot about it. I'm uh, talking to a lot of people who want to sell their businesses. I'm kind of our target demographic and I understand the pain points because I've gone through it myself. Um, but there's a lot to learn there. So for me, that was interesting. Like it's a topic I didn't know that much about. And then the other piece is um, one of the ways we're going to monetize is through our database. So we are, in addition to writing about these deals, we are aggregating them all into a database. So we have thousands of deals that are all online businesses that have um, transactions from the last couple of years between the, where the deal size is between 100,000 and 50 million. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And part of the reason I'm doing that is because that was my pain point when I sold. I was like, I want to have cops for all these businesses. And I had to try to find them manually. And it, quite frankly, just doesn't exist. Um, so anyways, we're building that. And, and our eventual goal is to allow people to access directly into that database and pull down the information that they want that's specific to their use case. And we're hoping that we can monetize through that. So I, for me, that was like a new way of um, monetizing a media company. 
um, you have to let us know when, when you do go live with that, because I want to be your first customer. I'm very, very fascinated in, in, in that across the board. Um, that is difficult data to come by. And sometimes when you are looking to sell, you, it's like a house. You, you got to find comp comparisons. Mm -hmm. You got to find comps. You don't know where those are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, in, in they got acquired, you've got, you've, you've got a lot of interesting conversations with sellers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people listening are sellers, but a lot of people listening are also buyers. They're looking for mm -hmm. that first acquisition. Um, what do you see? And, and, and I think happy sellers have happy businesses. What do you mm -hmm. see the difference between happy sellers and maybe you've run into some sellers who weren't very happy or had to sell because they were forced to, what mm -hmm. do you kind of see some of the differences between those two? In the sellers themselves? Yeah. in the sellers yeah. themselves. I mean, I think there are certainly sellers who have reached burnout and don't have it in them to do the things that they need to do to get the business ready to sell. Um, and a lot, it seems to me like a lot of people sell because they are burned out. The level of burnout is, is variable. <laughs> um, and I always say to sellers, like try to sell when you're like just hitting a little bit of burnout, not when you're like so far gone that you can't put the effort in to get through due diligence. Um, one common thread I see is a lot of sellers say that due diligence took more effort than they expected. And in fact, they found it difficult to balance that period with continuing to run the business, like in case it didn't go through. Um, or obviously you got to continue to run the business, business anyways, but many people are surprised with the effort it's, that's required there. Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, along those same lines, you have a seller who's sort of burnt out. They start going down this path. They see this exit and it's like one foot out the door, but they're still trying to run their business. Yes. I've almost seen it as like you, you're, you're almost trying to run two businesses. One that you're running to keep and maintain it. And the other mm -hmm. one is like, well, you're running this entirely separate business, which is to sell, right? Yes. So you're kind of running two businesses at once, super stressful. And I would wholeheartedly agree. If you've reached the level of burnout where you're just so burned out, you can't function. It's too late. It's too late mm -hmm. to sell because um, mm -hmm. you're not going to want to go through that due diligence process. On on the flip side, when you start seeing yourself dip a little bit, that's when I'm I'm starting to see. Oh, okay, like if you see yourself dip and the grass is greener on the other side, you start looking at and exploring what an exit could look like. Because mm -hmm. if you go too far down that path, then you you can't catch up. Yeah. And and how this kind of relates to buyers too is you'll be able to see this in sellers and know how to work with them. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes as buyers. Um, buyers see everything as like a deal, but in reality, it's not a deal. It's, it's a business that, you know, may have put the owner's kids through college, or mm -hmm. they've been running it for 20 years or 10 years or five years, whatever that is, or it's paid their mortgage and their, mm -hmm. their grocery bills for years. And so when you, when you switch the term from deal to, um, Hey, this is someone's baby, you know, mm -hmm. then you can understand where they're coming from and not just approach everything that they might be experiencing massive burnout, but you don't just kind of leave it out there for them. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's super helpful. Um, maybe burnout's probably one of them too. Everybody will exit their business. It's whether they are doing it by force or whether they're mm -hmm. kind of doing it at their own time too. Mm -hmm. um, from, yeah. from the sellers pull, that you, oh, go ahead. I was going to yeah. say to pull that, pull that thread a little bit. Something I've noticed as well is a lot of sellers, they really care who they're selling to. And I think this is something to think about. Like if you're a buyer, uh, is like, it's not just about the money to, to a lot of sellers, especially we, you know, we're covering six and seven figure sales and some low eight figure ones, but especially I find in that range, it's not all about the money. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, a, a buyer wants to sell, typically they want to sell to someone that they like and they respect, which I don't think people would admit that often because it looks too emotional or whatever, <laughs> but it's the truth is like, people want to pass their business over to someone that they respect and they can see right through somebody who, who either doesn't have that respect or doesn't, doesn't, you know, offer it generously. Um, and, and I had that same experience myself. Like I went through that. I had lots of offers for when I sold the right life and, you know, I really cared about who that went to. And it wasn't necessarily going to be the person who wanted to pay me the most money. That's that. So along the same lines, I, I bought one of my businesses four or five years ago. And the reason we, we, I think we won the deal, even though we were a little lower on price mm -hmm. was because they liked us more. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and, and it's hard to like monetize that or put a number to that because it's this intangible qualitative aspect of like, do you get along with that person? Mm -hmm. And so in selling the right life, Sounds like you had a lot of offers. Congratulations. That, that's really fun. And you're selling it in 2020. When in 2020 did you sell it? I sold it 
last year. So it was the beginning of 2021. Oh, beginning of 2021. So you kind of, mm-hmm. you know, I, basically 2020, you got to figure out whether it's <laughs> yeah. January 2020 or yes. you know, March, <laughs> very different times in the world. Yes. So um, when you're going through that process, you, you're deciding to sell. This is a project you had started in 2013. So you're pushing mm-hmm. almost a decade in this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, were there certain qualities you ended up picking in the buyer other than just liking them that you mm-hmm. thought, you know, they're going to be good stewards over the business. They were going to yeah. treat your employees well. Like what, what was the kind of the intangibles that you're like, Hey, it's not just price, but like these other yeah. things matter. I mean, when I say liking them, I think that all those things you just mentioned is really what, what that means is like, are they going to take good care of the business? Are they good people? <laughs> are they going to treat, treat your people? Well, I have curated this entire community. Are they going to take care of those people? Um, all of those things. So, I mean, I think when it came down to it, I I wanted someone, a, a, a buyer who was going to be in the same vicinity in terms of compensation. Um, Cause I had lots of people offer to, who wanted to buy the business who their offers are much lower and I really liked them too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would have liked to see the, you know, them. I, I, to me, I, I really, I am, um, I wanted to find a, a woman who would buy the site. I didn't end up doing that, but that was one thing that I was looking for. And I, I pushed myself hard to see if that was possible. And in the end, it wasn't. Um, and that's a whole nother story. But just to say, like, these are things that um, matter to buyers. You know, it's not just about how much money you offer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's always a balance too. You know, if, if you really like someone, but they don't have any money and then I can't pay you anything for it, you're like, okay, well, that doesn't really right. work. Like, there, there's always some <laughs> yeah. sort of balance. So don't, don't get too cocky listeners about like, you can just go in and, oh, they like me. You know, I'm going to put in mm-hmm. whatever offer. So um, I, I, in, in my experience in the exits that I've had too, every time I've looked to sell one of my businesses, I'm, I'm more, more concerned with uh, where is this business going to be in a year or two from now than I would have previously thought? Because mm-hmm. sometimes it's just like, hey, this is just a pure transaction for me and I don't have a 10-year history with the business. Um, but as you get to it, I don't know very, very, very few sellers who don't care about the the likelihood of that business succeeding down the road. And I yeah. think that's an important thing to distinguish too is everybody does care because when I look back at my career, there's certain like you know, time periods that were dedicated to different businesses. And, you know, mm-hmm. you can only have so many businesses that you're running and doing and things that you're doing in life and careers mm-hmm. and jobs. And I can kind of bucket, you know, oh, this is that business was when I had only one kid and he was three months old. And like these buckets and stages of life, my businesses have sort of followed that too. And I can tell the story of my life at different times through my businesses. Mm-hmm. And it, it's always been important to me to say, okay, well, do they have the right skill sets to be able to take this? Mm-hmm. to another level are they the right people for it because mm-hmm. your name is still associated with that business even for a long time after it's if not forever yes. right mm-hmm. people still think it's it, it, it's part of you um and I, extreme- I'll also just offer one other thing it's kind of goes along to that with that is um i think as a buyer there's an opportunity too to think about like ask the seller are there little things are well, I don't say little things but are there things that we can do here that sweeten this for you um, because I often talk to people who are like, oh, I, I want to sell this, but I have this tiny little thing holding me back. And I'm like, well, you just ask the buyer, they, that would be fine with them. I mean, it might, might be fine. It probably will be fine with them. For an example is like when I sold the right life, I wanted to keep, um, I, I had started this side business running retreats for entrepreneurs. And I had some people, I had a lot of writers signing up for these retreats and I had links in the right life uh, on posts that were doing very well in search sending traffic to those sites. And I wanted to keep those links in. So we agreed, Hey, they'll just keep those links in for a couple of years. And it was in the contract and it was no big deal to them and a huge big deal to me. So I think looking for those things that um, can be a huge win to the seller and really is pennies to the buyer can, can, and just show, showing that like you're open to that kind of um, negotiation can go a long way. I actually have a couple examples that I've seen because every seller has these little things that are not tied to money and they're yes. usually really odd. Um, <laughs> it's odd in the sense like it doesn't really make any sense, but in the seller's mind, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, one of my one of my friends, um, she had a, a mommy blog that she was selling and the Instagram account was basically like her personal one. But even though it had the same name as the blog and the blog did well, it was making $10,000 plus a month and she ended up selling the business. And then right at the last minute, she was like, can I keep the Instagram account? And after you like, 
at first the buyer was like, well, no way I need everything. And then he looked at it and he was like, I don't really need this. This is just like you and your family at the beach, you know, like this has nothing to do with the business, but it made sense to her and that she wanted it. I've also heard the story too, Lexi, of like, um, I know a guy who sold five subway franchises and he wanted one of the sticklers for him is he wanted like lifetime subway for his family. I'm like, <laughs> how much subway can one eat? You know, like, after like one subway, I'm like, I don't need to eat this again for like three years. You know? So I was like, it probably isn't going to be that much. It's not like he's eating $25,000 worth of subway. You're right. but that's important to him. Yeah. And the final thing that I always remember um, is I had a, a, a friend who went to sell their business and they ended up wanting to keep a small section of it that like wasn't really tied to the business, but it's more of like a personal passion. Mm-hmm. And half the buyers were like, no, way, I don't want it. I, I don't want anything to do with that. Like mm-hmm. I have to have everything. And the other half, like, yeah, sure. Whatever, you know? And of course he went and picked the ones that were okay working with him and letting him mm-hmm. kind of take this small little piece. But you now you never know until you ask, but mm-hmm. every, every seller will have some odd thing that's tied to it. And so, yeah. um, and, and, and that's where you're not going to find that out if you don't build the rapport with that seller and that mm-hmm. seller likes you and trusts you. So, yeah. um, well, I know we're, we're out of time. We're out of time because Lexi, I asked you like a million questions before we jumped on. It was fun <laughs> to reconnect. Um, we'll do this uh, do this again. Um, you've got one of your latest posts that you have is content site metrics that we'll link to also. But where can people find you and follow you and in, in what you're working on? Yeah, they got acquired.com slash newsletter. You'll be on our newsletter list. And the report you're talking about, just really quickly, we talked about the um, database and you said, let me know when that comes out. Well, we're releasing now slices of the database. So the report we just released was content and media deals. That's a tiny slice of the database. So you can see little pieces of what we're working on already. So it's a preview. It's a preview preview before the the full feature film. So Lexi, thanks so much for a few minutes of your time. Yeah, thanks.